Orders of the day, Audrey Dujour. Orders of the day, government orders, government business. Uh, first time consideration of government business motion number 25. Proceedings on Bill C-21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments, firearms. Motion standing in the name of the Leader of the Government. Mr. Algabra for Mr. Holland, seconded by Mr. Vandal, Vandal, moves that notwithstanding any standing order, special order, or usual practice of the House, Bill C-21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments, firearms, be disposed of as follows. A, it be an instruction to the Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security. Shall I dispense? No. Dispense? No? that during its consideration of the bill, the committee be granted the power to expand its scope, including that it applies to all proceedings that have taken place prior to the adoption of this order. Um, numero un, Satake. I address unlawfully manufactured, unserialized, and untraceable firearms, electronic in nature or otherwise including their parts, that can be purchased online and or assembled at home by amending the Criminal Code and the Firearms Act. Two, address the illegal acquisition of cartridge magazines by requiring a possession and acquisition license to purchase cartridge magazines. Number three. Mission of prohibition order and provisions relating to prohibition orders sections 109 and 110 to include prohibiting a person from possessing any firearm, crossbow, prohibited weapon, restricted weapon, prohibited device, firearms part, ammunition, prohibited, prohibited ammunition or explosive substances or all such things. Number four, armed the definition of prohibited uh, firearms in the criminal code to include a further technical description for an assault style firearm and criteria that includes any unlawfully manufactured firearms. Five, cinq, permet une modification qui allow for an amendment that will ensure a statutory review of the technical definition proposed in paragraph. I would ask the honourable member if he wants to have a conversation, he should take it around to the lobby. Number five, uh, number six, uh, numéro six, modifier la code. Number six, amend the criminal code as it relates to the proposed definition of prohibited firearm. Number seven, Add a definition of firearm part, which means to include a barrel for a firearm, a slide for a handgun, and any other prescribed part, but does not include, unless otherwise prescribed, a barrel of a firearm or a slide for a handgun, if that barrel or slide is designed exclusively for use on a firearm that is deemed under Section 84.3, not to be a firearm. Seven, uh, sub one, add new offenses and exceptions to the offenses. Dispense, shall I dispense? No. Uh, add new offenses and exceptions to the offenses relating to a firearm part or relating to computer data and provide for tech their enforcement and provide for the court to impose restrictions in relation to firearm parts. Seven sub two, expand the concept of orders under section 117.011 to include orders in respect of access to a firearm part. Number eight, add a new definition of semi-automatic, which in respect of a firearm means that a firearm to include a firearm that is equipped with a mechanism that following the discharge of a cartridge automatically operates to complete any part of the reloading cycle necessary to prepare for the discharge of the next cartridge. Number nine, numero neuf, ajouter une... Add a non-derogation clause affirming the rights enshrined under Section 35 of the Charter and of Rights and Freedoms. Number 10, allow for the addition of a regulation-making authority and definition respecting unregulated firearms. 
number 11, make any consequential or technical amendments. B, during consideration of the bill by the committee. I, the committee shall have the first priority for the use of House resources for committee meetings. Two, amendments filed by independent members shall be deemed to have been proposed during the clause by clause consideration of the bill. Number three. Then 20 minutes be allotted for debate on any clause or any amendment moved to be divided to a maximum of five minutes per party unless unanimous consent is granted to extend debate on a specific amendment and that the expiry of the time provided for debate on an amendment. The chair shall put every question to dispose of the amendment forthwith and successively without further debate. Four, the committee shall meet between 3.30 p.m. and midnight on, two, on the two further days following the adoption of this order. Numero cinq. Number five, if the committee has not completed the clause by clause consideration of the bill by 11.59 p.m. on the second day, all remaining amendments submitted to the committee shall be deemed moved. The chair shall put the question forthwith and successively without further debate on all remaining clauses and amendments submitted to the committee, as well as each and every question necessary to dispose of the clause by clause consideration of the bill, and the committee shall not adjourn the meeting until it has disposed of the bill. Number six, a member. Six, a member of the committee may report the bill to the House by depositing it with the acting clerk of the House, who shall notify the House leaders of the recognized parties and independent members, and if the House stands adjourned, the report shall be deemed to have been duly presented to the House during the previous sitting for the purpose of Standing Order 76.1 sub 1. Number numéro C. Au plus. C. Not more than one sitting day shall be allotted to the consideration of the bill at report stage, and on that day, the ordinary hour of daily adjournment shall be midnight and not later than 11.59 p.m. or when no member rises to speak, whichever is earlier. Any proceedings before the House shall be interrupted, if required, for the purpose of this order, and in turn, Every question necessary for the disposal of the said stage of the bill shall be put forthwith and successively, without further debate or amendment. D. Not more than one sitting day shall be allotted to the consideration of the bill at the third reading stage, and on that day the ordinary hour of daily adjournment shall be midnight, and that not later than 11.59 p.m. or when no member rises to speak. Whichever is earlier, any proceedings before the House shall be interrupted if required for the purpose of this order, and in turn, every question necessary for the disposal of the said stage of the bill shall be put forthwith and successively without further debate or amendment. And E, les jours de ces. E. On the sitting days, the bill is considered at report stage and the third reading stage after 6.30 p.m. No quorum calls, dilatory motions, or requests for unanimous consent shall be received by the chair. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I'd also like to acknowledge the impact colonization has had on Indigenous peoples with over-incarceration, over-representation in the foster care system, and the impact that it's had on missing, murdered, missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit people. I'm pleased to begin to debate today on the motion before the House and speak about the importance not only of this motion, but of passing Bill C-21 in a timely manner. Last week, we introduced a number of important amendments that rec reflected conversations had across this country with Canadians and Indigenous peoples. I'll acknowledge that we needed to step back and ensure we got Bill C-21 right, and the time we took was important to do that. We've introduced a new amendment to ensure that we do not derogate the Section 35 Charter Rights of Indigenous peoples. 
we've introduced a technical definition to prohibit firearms that inflict the most casualties in the least amount of time while respecting hunters, as well as a suite of measures to address the rise of ghost guns. It's been clear since the bill was first introduced that the Conservative Party had no interest the Honourable Member for Avignon, there's no French interpretation, Madam Speaker. Okay, we're having trouble with the interpretation. Is it working now? Parfait. Okay, fine. The Honourable Mem uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's been clear since the bill was first introduced that the Conservative Party had no interest in advancing this transformational legislation. Rather than asking relevant questions to officials, last week, Conservative members of the committee spent over three hours of the committee's time parroting speaking points of the gun lobby. In addition to their previous obstruction tactics, it made clear that the committee was going to be bogged down with unnecessary delays, and it would take not months, Madam Speaker, but years at that pace to see the bill report back to the House. In fact, Madam Speaker, the NDP um, member for New Westminster Burnaby asked twice for unanimous consent to add 20 hours to the, the um, study of the bill, uh, clause by clause, and were twice denied by the Conservative Party. Madam Speaker, I did the calculation. We're meeting three hours at the Public Safety Committee tomorrow. We're in this motion, we're, we're seeking eight and a half hours for two days, which is equivalent of the committee meeting until June the 15th, if we were to hold regular meetings. Madam Speaker, nonpartisan government officials received death threats due to their appearance at committee mm -hmm. as they provided technical advice on the bill, which underscores why it's critical to complete clause by clause promptly. That's why this motion is important today. And Madam Speaker, when I speak about death threats and intimidation, that is something that I have been subject to from the gun lobby since 2019 when I first spoke out during the debate on Bill C-71. I've received threats, intimidation, and these are a lot more than mean tweets, as the Canadian Coalition uh -huh. for Firearm Rights uh -huh. calls them. Uh -huh. Twice my riding was targeted by the gun lobby when they visited my riding in 2019 and 2021. And twice the constituents of Oakville North Burlington have stood up for gun control and stood up for the for the work that we're doing here in this House and sent me back to Ottawa in spite of the intimidation tactics that the gun lobby has tried to put against me. Madam Speaker, working in this place as an MP is a privilege that I don't take lightly. I've had the opportunity to work on many issues since I was elected and one that I'm most proud of is the actions that our government has taken on gun violence to prevent gun violence. I was elected to this place for the first time in 2015 and when you're elected as an MP, a number of things happen very quickly. You learn about the functioning of the House as one of 338 Canadians who have the privilege to take a seat at the Centre of Democracy. I was not expecting to be placed on the Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, but I'm grateful every day that this is where the whip chose to put me. I've worked hard to learn the file and advocate on really difficult subjects. Knowing that the issues the Public Safety, deals, sub Public Safety Committee deals with are ones that fundamentally shape our country and our work on it is fundamentally about building a better, safer and fairer Canada. Questions surrounding systemic racism and the oversight of law enforcement, how to build a correction system that upholds human rights and prioritizes rehabilitation, implementing needed safeguards to protect our national security from hostile foreign actors, and yes, Madam Speaker, gun control. Today, as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety and as a member of the Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security since 2016, I'd like to share the context of where we were, where we are now, and where we can go with the passage of Bill C-21, and why it is important to expand the scope of the bill and pass it in a timely manner. In 2019, Madam Speaker, Bill C-71, an act to amend certain acts and regulations in relation to the Firearms Act, received royal assent. Through Bill C-71, our government introduced mandatory lifetime background checks for anyone who applies for a license to purchase and own firearms, increasing the previous regime from a five-year background check. It also updated the Firearms Act to the modern age by requiring the Chief Firearms Officer to look at a firearms license applicant's online behaviour 
for signs of violence when making a determination on whether an individual was eligible to hold a license. The legislation also required people and businesses to have proof that they are selling non-restricted firearms to only those who are lawfully licensed to possess one. It ensured that when a court issues a prohibition against a person from owning a firearm that the weapon is forfeited to the Crown, instead of giving an individual the ability to give the firearms to a friend or family member. This ensures that those who shouldn't have access to firearms don't. These measures improved public safety and they ensured that those who enjoy the privilege of firearm ownership meet the test of a rigorous licensing regime. At the time, the Conservatives delayed the bill at committee and eventually voted against it in the House. Madam Speaker, while many refuse to talk about it, gun control is a woman's issue. The Canadian Women's Foundation notes that the presence of firearms in Canadian households is the single greatest risk factor for the lethality of intimate partner violence. Access to a firearm increases the likelihood of femicide by 500%. The Ontario Coroner's Death Review Panel said that 26% of women who were killed by their partner were killed using a firearm. In speaking with groups like the Lethbridge YWCA, they've told me that every single woman who came to their shelter had been threatened by a partner with a firearm. These are among the nearly 2,500 women victimized in this way over the past five years. Intimate partner violence accounts for nearly 30% of all police-reported violent crime in Canada. That number has risen during the pandemic. In my riding and across the country, local organizations like Halton Women's Place are helping to shine a brighter light on the dangers of gun violence. And Madam Speaker, over the last eight years, we as a country have also become more aware of the role that coercive control plays in abusive relationships. When you add firearms to the mix, it is a recipe for continued physical, emotional, and psychological abuse. In fact, coercive control, when a man uses a gun to control women without ever pulling the trigger, is real and happening right now. An Oakville resident sent me an email that stated, quote, let me just say that you can endure the physical and emotional abuse but when he pulls out a double barrel shotgun, loads it, and tells you he is going to kill you, then you know true terror. Thank you for looking out for the victims before they become statistics." End quote. Our government has been and will continue to advocate for women, and through Bill C-21, we're taking additional steps to support survivors of intimate partner violence who have been threatened with or on the receiving end of violence with a firearm. Bill C-21 introduces new red and yellow flag laws allowing courts to remove guns from and suspend the license of people who pose a danger to themselves or others, and ensures that those individuals subject to a protection order have their firearms license revoked. Bill C-21 marks an important next step in removing guns from the hands of abusive partners. In addition to the creation of these new red flag provisions, Public Safety Canada will establish a program to help raise awareness among victims about how to use the newly proposed provisions and protections. A guide about how to submit an application to the courts and the protections available could be developed, and the program could fund services to support individuals' applications throughout the court process. It would support vulnerable and marginalized groups, including women, people with mental health issues, Indigenous groups and other racialized communities to make certain that red flag laws are accessible to all, particularly to those who may need it most. The government will make available $5 million through a contribution program to ensure support and equitable access. Madam Speaker, enhancing licensing and the creation of additional tools for survivors of intimate partner violence is just one way our government is implementing stringent gun control that prioritizes public safety while still respecting those who own and use firearms. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to take us back to April of 2020 and the tragedy that unfolded in port au -Pic, Nova Scotia, where 22 innocent lives were lost over the course of a weekend rampage. We were all shocked and heartbroken. And as we learned the identities of the victims of these terrible crimes, we were reminded of the tragic impact that gun violence can have on all of our communities, urban and rural, from coast to coast to coast. 
Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, friends and neighbours were taken from us terribly, in a terrible, violent way, and far too soon. Gun violence is not a new thing in our society, but it's made all the more deadly with the proliferation of firearms that are more powerful than ever before. Assault-style firearms, those that were not designed for hunting or sport shooting, have become more and more prevalent in our Canadian retail market. And for as long as these guns have existed, they've been capable of inflicting tremendous damage when they fall into the wrong hands. For decades, chiefs of police, advocacy groups, grieving families and everyday Canadians have called for a ban on these types of firearms. Guns that were designed to kill people, intended in their purpose to kill people in the fastest time, and have been used in Canada, Madam Speaker, to kill innocent people. Canadians have been calling upon successive governments for reform, for stronger gun control, and in May in 2020, we took additional action through an order in Council to ban over 1,500 models of assault-style firearms, including the AR-15. As retired U.S. Major General Paul Eaton has said, quote, for all intents and purposes, the AR-15 and rifles like it are weapons of war, end quote. These weapons were designed for the battlefield and have no place on Canadian streets. Through Bill C-21, we're building on the work done in 2020 to offer a prospective technical definition to ensure that in addition to the weapons banned in 2020, no future similar weapons will ever be able to make it into the Canadian market. It responds to recommendations of the Mass Casualty Commission. Doctors for Protection from Guns called the definition, quote, a victory for science, public health, and Canadian values to permanently ban future models of assault weapons, end quote. Dr. Namja Ahmed said, quote, as a trauma surgeon, I can say there is no greater damage done to the human body than that from a semi-automatic assault weapon. I invite any MP who denies this reality to join me in the operating room, end quote. This scoping motion before us today, Madam Speaker, will ensure that this technical def definition can be included in Bill C-21. And that brings us to where we are today. Bill C-21 puts forward some of the strongest gun control measures in over 40 years. These new measures include implementing a national freeze on handguns to prevent individuals from bringing newly acquired handguns into Canada and from buying, selling and transferring handguns within the country. A freeze which, through regulations, has been in effect since October of 2022. Taking away the firearms licenses of those involved with acts of domestic violence or criminal harassment, such as stalking. Fighting gun smuggling and trafficking by increasing criminal penalties, providing more tools for law enforcement to investigate firearms crimes, and strengthening border security measures. Madam Speaker, over 75 per cent of firearms deaths in this country are by suicide. And there are provisions in the bill to help medical profession, professionals and others ensuring that firearms do not remain in the hands of those that are a danger to themselves or others. The new amendments that are outlined in the scoping motion before us also include tackling ghost guns, go guns that are privately manufactured or 3D printed. This is probably one of the most important things we can do for law enforcement in Bill C-21 to support them with the emerging prevalence of ghost guns. Members of the Public Safety Committee visited the RCMP gun vault and were able to see how quick and easy it is for criminals to 3D print firearms illegally. Police services across the country have told me how worried they are about ghost guns infiltrating our communities. In investigators like Michael Rowe of the Vancouver Police Service, who appeared at our committee during our study on guns and gangs, emphasized the need to create legislative solutions to address this gap so police have the tools to apprehend those creating ghost guns. During his appearance at committee, Inspector Rowe said, quote, one of the trends we're seeing out here in Vancouver right now is the use of privately made firearms or ghost guns. During the gang conflict, we're seeing more ghost guns specifically in the hands of people who are involved in active murder conspiracies or people who are believed to be working as hired contract killers. Ghost guns can be 3D printed or modified from what's called a polymer 80 handgun. Modern 3D printing materials can produce a durable firearm capable of shooting hundreds of rounds without a failure. For example, one of my teams recently completed an investigation in which we executed search warrants on a residential home. 
Inside this home, we located a sophisticated firearms manufacturing operation capable of producing 3D printed firearms. They had firearm suppressors and they were completing airsoft conversions, converting airsoft pistols into fully functioning firearms." End quote. The amendments before us in Bill C-21 are in direct response to Inspector Rowe's ask, which was, quote, I'd respectfully like to submit that a potential solution would be to bring in legislative remedies to regulate the possession, sale, and importation of firearms parts, such as barrels, slides, and trigger assemblies. This type of legislation would give us, the police, the necessary tools to be able to seize these items, get active enforcement action, and more effectively target the manufacturing of privately made firearms." End quote. Our proposed amendments to C-21 do just that. Police services across the country are sounding the alarm on this problem, and the amendments we are introducing to address ghost guns is another reason why C-21 is such an essential piece of legislation that will increase our public safety. To close, Madam Speaker, I'd like to share the words of Noor Samiyi. Noor was there that night at the Danforth shooting. She lost her best friend, Reese Fallon. Noor and Reese and their friends had graduated high school and they were out to celebrate Noor's birthday with their friends. Here are Noor's words, quote, What started off as a night of excitement celebrating my 18th birthday ended in sheer horror and misery. It's been almost five years since the Danforth shooting and I still struggle to find the words to speak about what happened. There will never be enough words to adequately convey how beautiful Reese was. As cliché as it sounds, she was like anyone I've ever met before. Another word for friendship is love. Friendship is one of the sweetest and more, most purest forms of love. Reese was love personified. She radiated so much light and shined so bright in any room she stepped foot in. She had a love so strong that nothing or no one could take that away. While some may argue we were in the wrong place at the wrong time, it does not take away from the fact that it was a legally imported handgun that was later stolen from a gun shop in Saskatchewan. That's why legislation is vital and crucial. Canadians are calling on us, Madam Speaker, to take action. Bill C-21 will save lives because the status quo is not good enough for Canadians. Because the status quo led to people like Reese not being here today. The status quo led to the slaughter of women at Polytechnique, the shooting rampage in Nova Scotia, this devastating taking of life at Dawson College and the mosque in Quebec City. The status quo has led to firearms deaths from coast to coast to coast. In my religion, Madam Speaker, we are taught that the gift of grace has been given to us by God so that we may give it to others, even if we do not think they deserve it. We don't deserve Nord's grace but we are given it anyways. Let's do something with that gift. Let's pass this motion before us so we can efficiently deal with C-21 and committee and the House and save lives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable for Prince George, Peace River, uh, uh, Northern Rockies. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. And I guess I just would point out a few things in, in the, the member's speech. You know, all along uh, this party across the way, we've, we've been trying to crack down on uh, illegal firearms coming in across the border illegally. Uh, we've been trying to deal with criminals and keeping those guns out of the hands of criminals. Uh, this party stands up and says, hey, we're doing great things, but meanwhile, they're lessening consequences for firearms-related crimes. And I think many Canadians are, are, have seen this already, and they see it. It's a hypocritical uh, thing to, to so-called crack down on, on firearms when they, uh, on one hand, uh, lessen consequences for firearms crime. But it's the one question I'm going to ask the member, it's about what she said in her speech. She referred to a shotgun. And so uh, we've already found out that they, they've been trying to ban hunting rifles, shotguns, etc. And, and she alluded to the fact that shotguns were bad. And I, I guess for clarity, I just want to know from this party opposite, are you trying to ban all firearms in Canada? The member has to address uh, the questions through the chair. Uh, the Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would uh, encourage the Honourable Member to read the bill because there are two provisions in the bill that we, um, we are passing in Bill C-21 that actually increases uh, crimes 
the, the uh, sorry, the penalties for firearms crimes from 10 years to 14 years. And it's ludicrous to say that the, the government is trying to ban all firearms in this country. In fact, we took the time um, to ensure that what we were putting in this bill was respectful of hunters, was respectful of Indigenous peoples, but by at the same token, Madam Speaker, keeping Canadians safe from the kinds of, of firearms that were designed for the battlefield. And there's a difference, Madam Speaker, between what hunters are using and what is being used in the battlefield. And to conflate the two, as the Conservative Party does and the Honourable Member, is unfair to Canadians. The Honourable Member for Avignon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In a few days, It'll be one year since the government tabled C-21. One year usually leaves enough time for the government and the opposition parties to debate a bill. But that's not what happened with C-21. We had the debate in the House, and then it was referred to committee. And then once the experts had been consulted on the bill, the government came up with new amendments on assault weapons. And the communications were bungled, and the amendments were withdrawn in February. And that left 13 weeks before, we, before they came back with another amendment, which we, they did last week. 13 weeks where there was no debate of C-21. It could have been amended in committee, but it couldn't be done because the government wasn't ready. And one of the things about those, now that they've tabled the new amendment, is that they want to limit the debate on C-21. And that shows that this government is incapable of working together. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. And I, I would remind the House that last week the NDP twice asked for unanimous consent to add an additional 20 hours of committee time for this week and were twice denied by the Conservative Party. Uh, my honourable colleague from uh, New Westminster Burnaby calculated that at the rate that we were going, it would actually be October of 2026 before we were able to complete study of the bill. So it's obvious that there is being obstruction of the bill in committee, and that's why we're moving this motion here today, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for um, Cowichan Malahat Langford. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank and I was glad to hear that the Parliamentary Secretary started her remarks with an acknowledgement of Indigenous communities because, of course, it was they uh, who led the way in fighting against the uh, amendments that the government brought in at the 11th hour, you know, with the Assembly of First Nations. So uh, I'm glad to see that those amendments were withdrawn. Um, I also want to thank committee members for having passed my amendment to uh, save the sport of airsoft. We've gotten a lot of very positive correspondence from that community uh, who are glad to see that the government's going to go back to the drawing board on that. Um, Madam Speaker, um, by my calculation, after tomorrow's meeting, the committee will have had eight hours on clause by clause. And if this motion passes, it will be an additional 17 hours, which will be the equivalent of 12 and a half meetings. By comparison, C-18 had only seven meetings. So I think there's going to be enough time to get this bill through. But I'd just like the Parliamentary Secretary uh, to talk about the other bills that are waiting their turn at the Public Safety Committee, Bill C-20 and C-26, and how important those are to get looked at. No Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I want to start by saying we, we, uh, we miss you. We miss him. Sorry, Madam Speaker. We miss him on the committee, although we welcome his colleague. Um, his contributions to this bill have been, have been important. And... He's absolutely right. The um, waiting in line at the Public Safety Committee is Bill C-20, a bill that will provide important oversight for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Canadian Border Services Agency, uh, something that has been called for for years to enhance that oversight for the RCMP, but also for the very first time provide oversight to the CBSA. And in addition to that, we have Bill C-26, which is uh, dealing with cybersecurity. So the member is absolutely correct. We have two important bills waiting that we can't get to until we finish Bill C-21, Madam Speaker. Comments? The Honourable Member for Sandwich, Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to ask the Honourable Parliament Secretary one thing about the motion, just to put on the record. It's a small complaint, but it, it matters, is that the reference to how we'll go forward over the next number of days refers to independent members, but nowhere refers to Green Party members. I don't imagine that the intent of the motion is to leave us out, but just to draw attention to the fact that we're not independents, and I do have amendments before the committee. My specific question to the Honourable 
Parliamentary Secretary, is this. The, it's about what this bill will do now to deal with the SKS semi-automatic rifles that have a 7.62 millimeter uh, dimension. This way was the rifle. It also was at an extended magazine. This was the gun, the type of gun used on June 28, 2022, in what was not actually a bank robbery in my riding. It was actually an attempt to kill as many policemen as possible, as fast as possible. Thank God, none of the police officers who were wounded, and many seriously wounded, six officers were in hospital following this devastating attack, some for months. I'm just wondering if we can get these weapons off the street. Many innocent people are killed and wounded, including police officers. Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her, her question and also the work that she has done uh, over the years on this issue. Uh, with regard to her specific question on the SKS, that was one of the firearms that was included on the list which has been withdrawn from the bill. However, the, the Minister has indicated that we are reconstituting the Canadian Firearms Advisory Council, and that council will take a look at those 482 firearms to determine in an in a independent way and provide advice to the government on which ones that we should move forward with. I think we've seen how uh, politicized and how divisive this debate has become. And by asking a, a nonpartisan independent advisory committee to take a look at these, um, these firearms, provide us advice on what we should, how we should be moving forward. In particular, um, the, the one that she has mentioned is one of the ones that they would be looking at. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Granville, a brief question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm, I was glad to hear the, the Honourable Member refer to uh, the Vancouver Police Department and the concerns that they have expressed about ghost guns in, in her speech. I guess one of the things that's really important in my community uh, is that we address the proliferation of these ghost guns, which are being seen more and more and more uh, in criminal activity. And I would like to ask the Honourable Member, um, what would happen uh, what would be the delays that would be caused? What are the consequences uh, of not moving forward with this on dealing with the very important issue of ghost guns, which affects all of our communities in urban Canada and in rural Canada? Our Parliamentary Secretary has one minute to respond. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And the, the Honourable Member has raised a very important point. Until this bill is passed, we don't have the, uh, the, the police don't have the tools that they need to deal effectively with ghost guns. And lives are being lost, Madam Speaker. These, these guns are cheap to manufacture. There are no, uh, there are limited tools available to the police. So the sooner we can get this bill passed, lives will be saved because we're giving police services not only in Vancouver, but across the country the tools they need. And we will be ahead of, of organized crime and gangs by passing this legislation and giving police the tools they need to deal with these. Thank you. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Kildon and St. Paul. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I'm very happy to be talking. Actually, I'll take that back. I'm not very happy to be talking about this today in the House of Commons, the circumvention of the democratic process and the very important discussion we're having at C21. Uh, I have a lot to say about the many amendments that were being discussed at C21, and I may not have the right to talk about those, at least uh, in a very, very limited way, at committee if this time allocation motion passes today, Madam Speaker. And um, I do want to just put on the record as well uh, to open this, what we're really talking about. The Prime Minister has made his true agenda very, very clear to Canadians. Uh, very recently, in the last four months, when we've been having this discussion of C-21 and the Liberal efforts to expand it to be the largest hunting rifle ban in Canadian history, when the Prime Minister was pressed about this after enormous backlash from the hunting, sports shooting, farming community and Indigenous community, he did admit that taking hunting rifles away is the goal when he said, quote, our focus now is on saying, yes, okay, yes, that we're going to have to take away from people who are using them to hunt when asked about the hunting rifle ban. So he said it himself. He's let Canadians know what his true intentions are. So no matter what the Liberals talk about, no matter what slogans or quick words or terminology they want to use or make up or pull out of thin air, he's made it very clear 
that the Liberal government, in partnership with the NDP and the Bloc Québécois, are going after firearms used to hunt by Canadian hunters, farmers, and Indigenous Canadians. So there's a lot to talk about today, and again, just to underline, if this passes, the discussion at committee that we're having about C-21, which actually has been proceeding now that the Liberals have let us resume the process of C-21 discussion at committee, is proceeding quite well. We've gone, actually, we've done almost half the amendments, and there are many, many, many amendments. We've done almost half of them in the time, in just two meetings, which is, considering how contentious this is, is record time record time. And considering they reintroduced a so-called new definition, the previous version, which is almost the same, uh, really put shockwaves through the firearms community in Canada. So you would imagine that our scrutiny as opposition parties is very high. So it's quite miraculous, actually, that we've been managed to get through that and half of the amendments for C-21, which amount to inches of paperwork, those amendments that impact 2.3 million gun owners, their families, their communities, hundreds of millions of dollars of our economy, and tens of thousands of jobs, not to mention centuries of culture and heritage in Canada. It is actually surprising that the parties have worked so well together at committee, and we've gone over almost half of the amendments in only two meetings. Quite surprising. So why the need for this motion? Well, it's very interesting. Part of the, the work that we've been doing at committee is to, of course, heavily scrutinize C-21 and the very sneaky and underhanded amendments that the Liberals introduced at the 11th hour of committee back in, I believe it was November 2022, that's when everything blew up about C-21 and hunters and farmers and Indigenous Canadians uh, saw the true feelings of this government to come after hundreds of their firearms. When that was going on, remember, C-21 is supposed to be the so-called handgun ban, which it's not really that either. And then they expanded it to banning hunting rifles, long guns, many, many, many hundreds of long guns. And so, of course, conservatives right off the bat said, well, that's not in the scope of the bill. We went to a vote at committee to rule it out of scope, to just kick this part out of C-21 for good. The NDP teamed up with the Liberals and voted down that out of scope vote. We could have stopped this right at the beginning if not for the NDP. And of course, they're working very closely with the Liberals on their true agenda to take away firearms from hunters, sports shooters, farmers, and Indigenous Canadians. That was right off the bat. And then I think the NDP was having some remorse, obviously, in their rural and northern communities. There was, there was significant backlash. I know for a fact that uh, the NDP member from northern Ontario got a lot of backlash. And so the, the NDP sort of moved to almost want to rule this out of scope, which we appreciated, the hunters appreciated. And now they've completely backtracked, despite almost the exact same definition coming in, and actually much worse, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so, again, Conservatives and our diligence at committee last week, we moved to rule this out of scope again, because, again, the bill is not about long guns. It's not about banning hunting rifles, and yet the Liberals, working with the NDP, are trying very hard to make that within the scope of the bill. They voted down that vote yet again. So it's very convenient that today's time allocation motion it's very long and talks about a lot of things, but in essence what it does, which is really important to remember, is it expands the scope of the bill. So they're retroactively expanding the scope of C-21 so that we can't rule it out of scope. Because of course a last stitch effort we could do, one last parliamentary procedure we could have tried, was going right to the Speaker to rule this out of scope with C-21 and considering he represents a rural riding with tons of hunters, sports shooters, farmers, I would imagine he would have considered it, especially considering that we're right and it certainly is outside the scope. So I find it very convenient that that's part of the objective of today's motion. Oh, it's in the scope, which eliminates all options for us to rule out of scope. No longer do we have any parliamentary procedure left to rule this out of scope. Very important for people to understand that. This is a nuclear option. This is what happens when, say, committees go awry and there's hours of filibusters and nothing is moving, but that's not what was happening at committee last week. Again, we accomplished going through half of the amendments in a highly contentious bill in only two meetings. Two meetings. Pretty impressive by every measure that I've seen in my time as parliamentarian. No reason for this at all. In fact, the NDP member on the committee has spoken more than almost anybody in the last two meetings. So it doesn't really make sense why they're trying to forcibly limit debate in the way that they're doing it. If this passes, at committee, we will only have five minutes to ask any questions about each clause. 
which if you've watched committee, which I know a lot of people interested in this have, we have to ask the officials, we've got to ask for clarification. Again, this impacts 2.3 million gun owners, their families, hundreds of millions of dollars of the economy, tens of thousands of jobs, centuries of culture and heritage in Canada. So the idea that we would limit debate so severely is very concerning to us, especially since we've been acting in good faith and have got through half the amendments in two meetings. I can't stress that enough. So I was very surprised to see this over the weekend, I have to be honest, Madam Speaker, it was a real slap in the face to the work that we've been doing at committee. If we wanted to drag it out, we could still be talking about that definition. There are so many ambiguities in that so-called new definition. We could easily be talking about that still. And yet we had our questions. We recognize that there's other things to talk about at committee. It is a public safety committee, and we're in a public safety crisis in this country because of repeat violent offenders that the Liberals keep letting out of jail. I'll talk about that later. So many things we should be talking about in the Public Safety and National Security Committee. So we're moving along, and this is what we get. A real lesson to me, Madam Speaker, about working together at committee. I've learned my lesson today, Madam Speaker, about giving any benefit of the doubt, acting in good faith at all. Obviously, it's upsetting, because we are working hard at committee, and we are doing our due diligence, and this is what we get, forcing the elimination of proper debate and scrutiny on C-21 amendments that impact millions of people. But anyway, I think I've harped on that enough. Maybe I'll come back to it later. So let's talk about this new definition, right? It's really not new. It's just almost like lipstick on a pig, for lack of a better word. So I'll outline the old definition. I'll read it to you now, Madam Speaker. It said, a firearm that is a rifle or shotgun that is capable of discharging center fire ammunition in a semi-automatic manner and that is designed to accept a detachable cartridge magazine with a capacity greater than five cartridges of the type for which the firearm was originally designed. That was the original definition. We called G4. It was G4. So folks have heard G4. That was G4, along with a number of other things from the May 2020 OIC, which people are very familiar with. And then it was also table dropped, or it was not table dropped, it was provided in a very short order in a very sneaky underhanded way with G46, which folks will remember was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages long and looked to ban an additional almost 500 long guns. That's where the infamous and very, very popular for hunting, particularly the indigenous community, SKS was found. And again, this list was massive. It was about, I don't know, three, I can't, I can't show you because I can't use props, but it was about three inches thick. So they dropped that in a very sneaky and underhanded way along with this definition. So again, months went by, there was a massive uproar, hundreds of thousands of phone calls and letters and social media posts from the firearm community across Canada. And the Liberals, for once, I've never seen this before, relented and withdrew G46 and G4, wow, wow, that was actually quite shocking. I've never seen them back down on anything before. So that was round one, as we found out. Round two, here we are, yet again, almost no change. And actually, I would argue it's worse now, and I'll tell you why. So this is the new definition, I just read the old one. It says, a firearm that is not a handgun, and that discharges center fire ammunition, mentioned before, in a semi-automatic manner, mentioned before, and was originally designed with a detachable magazine with a capacity of six cartridges or more. And so there was a bit of weasel word change there, but very, very subtle, Madam Speaker. And so the reason they mention that a firearm that is not a handgun, it's interesting, more weaselly maneuvering here. The French translation for what they originally had was fusil de chasse, which means hunting rifle. That was the direct French translation of what they were trying to ban last year, late last year. But of course, there's tens of thousands of hunters, sports shooters, and farmers in rural Quebec. I think the block forgets this, but there are. And uh, they were in an uproar, obviously. So now the government has worked this out so that, oh, at least it doesn't say hunting rifle in French. But that is the translation of what they were trying to ban just in November. Let's just be clear about that. They just switched around the words a little bit, Madam Speaker. Very interesting. And so what's very problematic about this, Madam Speaker, is that the, the, the government has, bra not bragged, I shouldn't say that, but they have, we'll say boasted, we'll say, or talked at length 
about how they're not bringing forward the big list. Don't worry, the big lists, we're not gonna, we're not gonna ban those in legislation. That was what the public could scrutinize. There was over four, almost 500 additional rifles and shotguns in there, many very commonly used hunting rifles. And so there was a lot of them in there and the public could at least see the list and they did and they were shocked at the amount of hunting rifles that were being banned. Now the government said, don't worry, we're not bringing forward the list again, just the definition. But what they're doing in a very sneaky, underhanded way seems to be a theme when it comes to banning hunting rifles for this government. Let's do it, uh, you know, back door. They are bringing forward a firearms advisory committee and they keep referring to the Firearms Advisory Committee. When asked about the SKS, for example, that doesn't technically fall under this definition, but was on the original list, they've as much as told us that the Firearms Advisory Committee will look to ban that. The minister has, that, has said that, the parliamentary secretary has referred to that immediately when asked about the SKS, oh, the Firearms Advisory Committee will be looking at that. So what is this, the Fire, Firearms Advisory Committee? Well, they're saying it's a nonpartisan group of experts they're putting together. We've heard that before. They've had similar advisory committees for firearms and they've had some of the biggest anti-gun groups in the country on that so-called advisory committee that they've had before in a previous iteration. So I don't trust for one minute that there's going to be advocates for lawful firearm ownership for hunters, sports shooters, farmers and Indigenous Canadians in this regard from this perspective on that committee. Not for one minute, Madam Speaker, do I trust that that's going to be the case. And they keep referring to that committee whenever we ask about the SKS. So to me, it's very clear, and the language that was used just today in the House, if I could find it here, was very telling. She said, uh, we will take a look at that. She was referring to the SKS uh, and the 482 firearms to decide which ones to move forward with. She was, when she was asked about the SKS, that's what she was referring to the Firearms Committee. To decide which ones to move forward with banning was what she was talking about. So, but it's, again, very sneaky because there's no list we can scrutinize. It's just some unelected body, the Firearms Advisory Committee of so-called experts, which we know will be partisan anti-gun groups from the country. They will be coming up with lists to ban. So this is actually worse than what we had before, Madam Speaker, because now we can't see the list. It's just going to be sort of not even announced likely. It's just going to be new lists added to the OIC or some other version of it that people will find out somehow down the road that they can no longer own. Very arbitrary list indeed. And I'll remind folks that in May 2020, after the worst mass shooting in Canadian history, it was, a third, it was the worst mass killing actually in Canadian history. And in, in the hours and days following that, when people hadn't even had the chance to bury their loved ones or properly mourn the people that had been lost by that vile, sick killer, this government was scheming to bring forward the May 2020 OIC, and they did. And there was 1,500 long guns that were banned in the cloak of darkness during the middle of the pandemic, just as it hit Canada. Canada. Remember, it was in May. The pandemic had just hit about a month prior, a month and a half prior. They banned that, and they subsequently added 400 more long guns over the last couple of years to that. And then in November, another almost 500 added on again. So they're not going to stop. And you ask any liberal. Oh, is this going to be the last firearm ban you're going to bring forward? I would be shocked if any of them said yes. Because again, this firearm committee is going to be bringing forward tons of more firearms to ban. Again, they keep referring to it when we ask about the SKS, a ubiquitous hunting gun in this country, Madam Speaker. So I don't trust them at all. And again, we've been acting in good faith. And here we are with this time allocation motion to limit democratic debate, Madam Speaker. Order the Honourable Member for Vancouver Granville. The Honourable Member noted that she was dealing with the criteria. She's ignored one important criteria, and that, that seeks to, to taint the conversation. I would just say that this is a point of debate and not a point of uh, order. It's a point of debate and not a point of order. The Honourable Member for um, Kildonan St. Paul. Thank the you, Madam Speaker. I, I just want to remind the Honourable Member, he will have an opportunity to ask questions and comments. So if, if uh, depending on how many people rise to be recognized, the Honourable Member for Kildon and St. Paul. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'll just remind uh, the Liberal Member, if he's looking to throw me off, then he's severely underestimating me like many a man before him. I have a lot to say, Madam Speaker, and I will be here for quite some time. So hopefully he's hydrated and fed because he's going to be waiting a long time. 
All right, so more on the announcement last week that is impacted by C-21, Madam Speaker. So the minister at the same time announced his Firearms Advisory Committee, the so-called new definition, old definition, but sneak here. He also announced that there's going to be something about a permanent alteration to magazines, which we have already, but the way that he worded it would signify to me that there's going to be a change of what that means. And when we tried to ask about the committee, we wouldn't get any answers because it wasn't technically within C21, apparently, but he announced at the same time he was talking about C21. The Liberals wouldn't answer our questions. The officials wouldn't answer our questions. But what was taken from that in the firearms community, that the permanent alteration of magazines would go a step further than what's done now, and it would impact a many, many, many a firearm that really is Grandpa Joe's hunting rifle. For example, the Lee Enfield very popular firearm. It was the British firearm up until about the 1950s, and it was well made, it's been passed down through generations, it's completely wood stock, it's exactly what you'd think and picture when you think about Grandpa Joe going out to hunt deer. Exactly what you'd think. However, you cannot permanently alter the magazine capabilities of that firearm without destroying it. There is no way. So is the minister saying now that he's going to destroy the Lee Enfield? He won't answer. I, I urge people to write in and ask the minister about that because he won't answer our questions about it. Neither will the Liberals on Public Safety Committee. I will also note that, two, that firearms, and these are really old school hunting rifles, uh, tubular magazine firearms, that's where you put the, the bullet right in the tube, so to speak. There is no magazine like you'd think, like the image that the Liberals bring forward. It's an old school 1800s level technology of firearm. You put them in the tube. They have capacity, like example, the Winchester 1873, I think it's called, is a tubular magazine firearm that holds seven to 14 cartridges or bullets. And you cannot alter that in any way. You would destroy the firearm. These are heirloom firearms. I'm pretty sure my grandfather had one in the closet for when coyotes would try to get into the chicken coop. That's how old school these firearms are. And there are hundreds of versions of these that are within rural Canada and for collectors and certainly for hunters and Indigenous Canadians. If the SKS is popular in Indigenous communities, so is the Lee Enfield, let me tell you, Madam Speaker, in Indigenous communities. So why won't they be clear of what they're talking about when they talked about these permanent alterations to magazines? Why are they being so cagey about that? Do they just not know? Is it ignorance or are they hiding something? I don't know. I've given them the benefit of the doubt before, and yet here we are. They're forcing an end to the democratic discussion and scrutiny that is needed on this bill in committee today. So I really don't trust anything that they're about to say on that, if they say anything at all, because they've refused to answer my questions and our questions on public safety about the Lee Enfield and Tubular Magazine long guns. So this is going on. We've heard so much about this, and the Liberals are really attacking us, particularly me, I suppose, because I've been the lead on the firearms. They talk about Conservatives more in their announcements that they talk about the crime that is wreaking havoc in our communities that they're not doing a lot about. And Madam Speaker, I do want to say that I know that this debate is very heated, very, very personal to people on all sides. I recognize that. I have always done my best to lead this discussion from our perspective, from a from a professional standpoint, an authentic standpoint. And what really shocked me, Madam Speaker, was last week, was it last week or was it the week before? Might have been the week before, when the minister was announcing his so-called phase one of the buyback, which I'll get to. He said that, in essence, that conservatives were at fault, bared some of the responsibility for the abuse that liberals are getting from uh, what they say are gun owners. I have no idea. I haven't seen that. What's really interesting, Madam Speaker, is they talk about it as if we haven't received any abuse about people who don't agree with our position. And I can tell you that I have certainly received very threatening abuse for my position and for our position that we've taken. I am the lead on this file. I have taken many hits, many threats, concerns for my safety in this debate. So I was very offended when I heard them trying to blame conservatives, and I'm the lead in this regard, so me, when I have not been saved or kept from any of that abuse myself. I am undeterred. I will continue on. I will not be bullied to be into silence on this. But just to be clear, 
The rhetoric from the Liberals is trumping up a lot of hate towards myself and others on this side of the House as well. And I don't like talking about it. We don't want copycats. We don't want any heroes from these evil, sadistic people. But when I heard something like that, I thought, you know, I have to say something. I've kept quiet, but I will not stand idly by while the Minister of Public Safety blames me for the abuse he's gotten for his underhanded policies when I, too, have suffered abuse because of his rhetoric. So I just wanted to put that on the record, Madam Speaker. I hope to speak to the Minister personally about that. So we were talking a lot about firearms, and of course, exclusively C-21 only impacts, really, particularly the so-called handgun freeze or ban, which really isn't any of that, really impacts only people who follow the law, which are the trained, tested, and vetted Canadian citizens who are approved by the RCMP to own firearms. That's really all the people that are impacted by all of these measures since the May 2020 OIC and Bill C-71 before. It only impacts regular, everyday Canadians who are legally allowed to own firearms, heavily vetted Canadians who are legally allowed to own firearms. And yet they continue to bring forward measure after measure after measure to attack this group of people. Madam Speaker. Meanwhile, criminals are running rampant on our streets. I've talked at length about the crime issues. Canadians know full well what's been going on on public transit and on the streets of Toronto and everywhere you go in Canada. There seems to be horrific headlines of innocent people being attacked by complete deranged strangers. We are facing very serious issues, and yet the Liberal Budget 2023 really failed to address those violent crime issues. In fact, they didn't mention violent crime was not mentioned once, zero times in that budget. You want to know what else wasn't mentioned in that budget, Madam Speaker? Bail reform. Bail reform was not mentioned once in the budget, has not been mentioned in the priorities of that budget from the Minister of Public Safety. Despite the fact that all premiers of every province and territory in Canada have written two letters now to the Prime Minister demanding bail reform because what is happening in their provinces and territories in terms of crime and repeat violent offenders continuing to get bail and back on our streets hurting Canadians. When have you ever heard every Premier in the country agree on a letter? It's very rare. Maybe when they're asking for health care funding. But aside from that, it's a very rare occurrence. And yes, now it's two letters sent to the Minister of Public Safety. About actually also sent to the Prime Minister, I should say. Those letters were sent to the Prime Minister, pardon me. Also, municipal police forces. I just spoke at the Big Ten Police Conference, which is every major police association, municipal police forces, of municipal police forces across the country. I just flew to Calgary last week to speak to them. They are demanding bail reform. Every big city mayor in Ontario is demanding bail reform, Madam Speaker. So while all, everyone seems to agree on bail reform, there's been no meaningful action or change taken by the Minister of Public Safety on bail reform. And I'll remind those watching that of violent crime in this country, which is up 32% from 2015 to 2021, which when we get the 2022 stats, it's going to be deeply concerning. I'm going to guess that they're going to be way up just based on the headlines. So 32% between 2015 and 2021, which equates to 124,000 more violent crime incidents per year, which is an insane amount of additional crime that police are having to deal with despite police numbers really suffering, which I'll talk about more in a minute. So we're seeing that crime wave steadily increasing year by year under this Prime Minister and Public Safety's watch. That's all happening. And actually on that, bail reform is a huge issue because if you look at Vancouver, of these, there were 6,000 crime incidents, like interactions with police for crime, 40 people responsible for 6,000 interactions with police. Those 40 people are sure keeping police busy in Vancouver, Madam Speaker. And these are violent repeat offenders causing havoc on transit, walk, when you walk down the street with your family, when you're trying to enjoy the parks. 40 people causing 6,000 interactions with police in one year. And yet, crickets about bail reform. Oh, we're meeting and talking about it. That's all we hear. It's been months. It's been months. In fact, the Victoria Police recently put out a news release. I think this is consistent on their news releases when it's relevant. Recently put out a news release where some vile rapist who committed 10 sexual assaults with a weapon, 10 sexual assaults with a weapon, this man, 
Why was he released? Well, the police wanted to make sure the public knew why it wasn't their fault he was released. At the bottom of the news release, it says, why was this person released? Bill C-75, wow. Madam Speaker. That is a liberal bill from a few years ago, which made, in essence, the default for bail for violent repeat offenders. They just got bail on default. And so now, you know, chickens coming home to roost. We're seeing a massive crime surge. This is one of the reasons police are underlying the, underlining this and making this heard to MPs over and over and over again. And yet that's all going on. We're hearing from the Toronto police statistics that they put out. Of the 44 murders, I think it was last year or 2021, of the 44 murders, 26 of them or 24, about over half. Of the 44 murders, over half of them, the murderers were out on bail at the time. It's unbelievable. Out on bail. Shame. Over 44 murders, over half of them could have been prevented if the Liberals hadn't brought in such a weak bail regime. And they're getting up at the mic and talking about how this so-called new definition, old definition, no list, sneaky list given to the Firearms, firearms Advisory Council. They're talking about how that's going to solve crime or one of the issues, things that's going to solve crime. Shame. It's not going to do anything for the people in Toronto that are getting out on bail and murdering people, which Toronto police will remind us that about 9 out of 10 firearms that are used in crime, and it's mostly handguns in Toronto, are smuggled in from the U.S. You could outlaw, and I'm sure they're working on it, every single handgun legally owned in this country, and it will get worse in cities. It will continue to go up, yeah. the statistics, because they're not legally owning them, these criminals, Madam Speaker. They're, most of them are prohibited from ever going near a firearm. Most of them should be in jail. Repeat violent offenders because they smuggle them in quite easily through the Prime Minister's very porous border that is just, he just allowed all these drugs and guns to come in to the country and human trafficking and all kinds of other things he's allowed under his watch, just flowing into Toronto and other big cities and Montreal as well and Winnipeg. I've seen the firearms myself, Winnipeg police have shown me, the smuggled ones. And 3D printed guns. People are just taking those 3D printers and printing plastic handguns, going for $7,000 a pop on the streets of Winnipeg. Bill C-21 will do really not a lot for that. There is an amendment we worked together to maybe give police a teeny little extra tool, which I support it. But going after lawful firearms owners isn't going to do anything right. for the problems in Toronto. Those 20 odd people who were murdered by those on bail reform who smuggled guns in or printed them, Nothing in C21 is really going to stop them. And the Liberals talk about, oh, well, we're increasing mandatory or maximum sentencing on gun smugglers. That is technically true, but in reality is baloney, Madam Speaker. We did a information request to government, one of my colleagues, did great work there, asking about how many people have received the maximum sentence right now for gun smuggling. Do you know how many since this Prime Minister has ruled the country? In about eight years that he's been Prime Minister, I don't know how many people have got the maximum 10-year sentence for gun smuggling uh, activities? Zero. Wow. Zero people Shameful. have gotten the mandatory maximum. Brutal. So to increase it to 14 is really not going to do a whole heck of a lot, Madam Speaker. What they should have done is maybe bring in mandatory minimums for gun smuggling. Now that would have taken criminals off the streets. Thank you. Exactly. So that would have actually done something, maybe. Maybe. And we were looking at maybe doing that with an amendment, but we were told it was out of scope, so we couldn't bring forward mandatory maximums. But maybe that's something a member for Carleton as Prime Minister of the country will look at, because that'll make a real actual difference on cracking down on gun smuggling, Madam Speaker. And I'll remind the House that the Liberals, how they're going after lawful firearm owners to such a degree and with so much taxpayer dollars and so much effort from the Minister of Public Safety going after lawful firearms owners. At the same time, in the fall, the Minister of Justice brought forward or passed a bill that he apparently celebrated quite, uh, quite excitedly when it was passed to remove mandatory maximum or minimum sentences, pardon me, for serious gun crimes and violent crimes. You want to know what the list is? Robbery with a, with a gun. You can rob a store with a gun and no longer a guarantee that you're going to jail. That's uh, the prime, Liberal Prime Minister's vision of what we should do about crime. You can rob someone at gunpoint. No longer a mandatory minimum for you.
extortion with a firearm, weapons trafficking, importing or exporting, knowing it is unauthorized, discharging a firearm with intent, so things like drive-by shootings, no longer mandatory prison time for you, Madam Speaker. Shameful. Using a firearm in commission of an offence, breaking the law with a gun, no longer mandatory prison time. All right. Possession of a firearm, knowing its possession is unauthorized, so illegally possessing a firearm. No longer mandatory prison time for you. So all those criminals in Toronto, always oh, a good day for them, Madam Speaker, when Bill C-5 passed. Possession of a prohibited or restricted firearm with ammunition. So you can have a prohibited gun with a whole bunch of ammunition, no longer mandatory prison time for you. Again, gangs are celebrating this Liberal Prime Minister every time he's elected. Possession of a weapon obtained by commission of an offence, so stealing one in essence, no longer mandatory prison time. Possession for purpose of weapons trafficking, excluding firearms and ammunition, and discharging a firearm recklessly. Discharging a firearm recklessly, no longer mandatory prison time. You know, people die in cities because there's gangsters discharging firearms recklessly all the time, ones that they've smuggled in and 3D printed. No longer mandatory prison time for them, Madam Speaker. In fact, in that same bill, Bill C-5, the Liberals brought forward uh, sort of a, an improved option for sexual assault, or people who commit sexual assault, now they can ensure, it ins the law ensures, pardon me, that people who commit sexual assault, rape, don't have to go to prison. They can actually serve house arrest from the comforts of their homes. Rapists can serve their sentence playing video games with their feet up in their own homes. Madam Speaker, it's unreal. I, I, I find, I'm, I shouldn't be kind of laughing about it, but it is so outrageous and ridiculous. It's hard for me as a woman to wrap my head around a so-called feminist government saying that rapists can serve house arrest for their sentence. And this, this happened. This just happened in Quebec, Madam Speaker. A vile rapist violently raped a woman and got zero days in prison and only 20 months in house arrest. Shameful. So this is all in the scope of what the Liberals view as their crime priorities. And they're getting up at the mic every other day announcing new gun control measures to go after folks who are lawfully allowed to own firearms and saying that that's going to make a difference. You know what to make a difference? Repealing Bill C-5 and making sure violent criminals and rapists go to jail. Sure. That'll make a difference on public safety. Okay. So, and it's not just firearms. In fact, a lot of the crime we're seeing is knives. Where's the conversation about knives? We just had... I believe it was the third largest mass killing in Canadian history. Barely heard a peep about that, certainly not from the Liberals. We tried to study that committee and they wouldn't let us. Just in the fall, the third largest mass killing in Canadian history, a man who got out on parole despite... Oh. What, uh, one moment. Uh, we have a point of order. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm sure the Honourable Member doesn't mean to, mean to mislead this House, but there was absolutely no... Uh, no stoppage of anything on the stabbing at James. I would say that First this is Nation. debate. So I, I unfortunately, hope she's not trying to mislead. The yes, I, I, I would say that this is debate, and I would ask the honourable parliamentary secretary to consider rising uh, to be recognised for a question during the next um, when it's time for questions and comments. The honourable uh, uh, member for uh, Kildonan St. Paul. Respectfully, to that member, Madam Speaker, I remember those committee meetings very, very well. I tried very much, so did my Conservative colleagues on committee, to bring forward an urgent study of what happened, how the parole system failed the 11 people that were butchered by knife by that man who was out on parole, the 17 more that ended up in prison, the third largest mass killing in Canadian history. You think that that would be an urgent, urgent priority to review what happened in our parole system? And we were given excuses, oh, let the people do their work. Sure. We could, they could do their work, but we need to know what happened now, or we need to know how we can prevent it now. At least an intro study. I was very clear that we needed to study that right away and perhaps have a follow-up once we heard more. That was met on deaf ears. The third largest mass killing in Canadian history was not a priority for public safety. They were too busy planning to bring forward the most underhanded amendments that it constituted the largest hunting rifle ban in Canadian history. Too busy to study the third largest mass killing in Canadian history. I could talk all day about that, Madam Speaker, because I feel quite strongly about it. Why is it that a First Nations community that had 11 people butchered by a man on parole was not prioritized? We barely talked about it. The Public Safety Committee has not looked into that. I think that is a failure that we could be talking about if the government wasn't so occupied with coming after lawful firearms owners, yeah. Madam Speaker. 
That man, I believe, had 59 prior violent crime convictions. Why was he allowed out on parole? I don't know. But 11 people are dead and 17 more were stabbed with a knife by that vile man. A lot of knife attacks are happening and bear mace attacks actually as well. I have a friend who just told me that his kids got on, uh, I believe he's in the Calgary area, got on public transit, his kids are just going to a party, college aged kids. Just nice young people, bear maced. All of the whole group bear maced. And the police had told them that that had been the eighth time that had been happening recently. Eighth time some punks had bear maced innocent people on public transit. Okay, well they lived. So maybe the Liberals don't think it's a priority to talk about, I don't know. But the stabbings, where young people are being stabbed to death on public transit and older folks, in fact, there was a violent knife attack on a Surrey Skytrain, which is their public transit, that left a young man in hospital, and the suspect, the man who attempted to murder that man with a knife, was let out on bail about nine days later. Madam Speaker, and you're telling me that bail reform isn't in the budget. Nine days later, someone who had stabbed someone, attempted to murder him, out on the streets, this is Liberal Canada, Madam Speaker. But it's important to go after lawful gun owners, apparently. And then this follows the death of a 17-year-old also in BC who was stabbed to death on a bus. Died. He was murdered by knife by a murderer on a bus just recently. And this followed a 16-year-old boy who'd been stabbed and killed in Toronto Public Transit Station. These are young people that are being murdered. And there's countless other examples. There was a woman who, had, who was ice-picked uh, last year, there was a woman who was set on fire in Toronto near a public transit stop, I believe. There are, are elderly people who are being pushed to their deaths. Like, it is common now for people to feel uncomfortable riding public transit. And we're not talking about bail reform. There's no action coming forward of bail reform, how to clean up our streets. And yet we're talking every other day about going after lawful. I mean, I can go on and on about how frustrating this is and to speak nothing of what police have experienced in the last year. So bail reform, we've been talking about it in for quite some time, but the country really started talking about it quite strongly just over as a result of something that happened over Christmas. There was a man, and again, this will, nothing that the Liberals have announced will do anything to stop what happened to Greg Priscilla. Young OPP officer, about 27 years old, you know, young, keen on the job, December 27th, just two days after Christmas, there was a, I think it was a truck in a ditch. He approached the truck in the ditch and the driver shot and killed him. That driver, lifetime repeat violent offender, lifetime uh, weapons prohibition order, out on bail at the time, shot and killed that police officer. He's no longer with us because of our bail system, Madam Speaker. So that sparked, obviously, a national outrage, and that's where the first letter from the Premiers went to the Prime Minister demanding bail reform, obviously. And then there's been a sub subsequent one, and police have been very vocal. In fact, the Toronto police and these police guys and gals are like stoic people, getting emotional, speaking up at the mic at their meetings about the need for bail reform. And he, actually, Greg Priscilla, was one of 10 police officers killed in the last year, eight of them on the job. That is insane numbers for police murders. Unbelievable. And please, pardon me, I've had a pretty rough go of it over the last number of years. Their morale is very low, and yet these are dedicated men and women who kiss their families goodbye in the morning and are never 100% sure if they're going to see them again. Especially after a year like this. Ten of them, eight of them on the job. Most of them, or many of them involved, are murdered by repeat violent offenders who shouldn't be out on our streets. Unbelievable that we're not talking about bail reform, that they're not making announcements about bail reform every day, or parole reform. <laughs> These guys, and it's mostly guys, that are getting out over and over again, shouldn't be on the streets. I think almost everyone agrees with it, except extreme leftists who want to go soft on crime, who seem to have taken over the Liberal Party crime agenda. It's unbelievable, Madam Speaker. And so, if we're looking at even in BC, NDP province, to its full credit, NDP province, writing to the Liberal cabinet about all their violent repeat offenders. These are unbelievable statistics. I had to check them on the article that was published about a week or two ago to make sure they were right, but it seemed by the reporting that these are them, and I'll read them to you. There were 1,325 violent offenders on trial, but prosecutors, so government lawyers, asked only for detention 516 times. So over 1,300 violent criminals, government lawyers only asked for about 500 of them to not get bail. 
And of those 500 that they actually asked for, judges only granted bail denial 222 times. So of over 1,300 violent repeat offenders in BC, only 221 of them actually were denied bail. That is astounding. That is less than 20% of violent criminals not getting bail. Why isn't the number higher? It should be asked every single time someone has a violent record, shouldn't it? Why are they only asking for it less than 50%? Why are government lawyers asked, asking only half of the time, actually less than half of the time? And why are judges only saying less than 20%? Yeah, this violent repeat offender with a long rap sheet shouldn't be on a bail. I don't know. I'm not a judge, not a lawyer. I don't have the expertise to talk about that. But the Liberal government and the Justice Minister in charge of our criminal code should be talking about why that is happening and how we can fix it, how our justice system can be better supported with criminal code changes and other measures to ensure that our court systems are equipped to ensure that the most violent people do not get out on bail so that the 17-year-old boy in BC who was stabbed to death, so that he's not being stabbed to death, so the 16-year-old boy in Toronto, so that he's still alive, so Greg Priscilla still alive, so that in parole, the parole board, which I will add on that, there's been a 36% decrease in the amount of staff on the parole board, an 11% funding cut for some reason. Maybe that's why we get mistakes like what happened in the fall on James Creek First Nation, where that man I mentioned already killed and murdered 11 people, butchered them to death. I mean, I just, it's so frustrating as a, even just not as a conservative, just as a Canadian, as a woman who cares about the safety of my family, walking down the streets, women already have sort of a fifth sense about this a bit, you know, we're, we're concerned walking at nighttime, concerned getting into an elevator alone with a bunch of men. This is innate in us. And to see that women no longer want to ride public transit in many cases, especially in Toronto, our biggest city, and they're not really talking a lot about that when we have a clear demand of bail reform. But C21, that's the priority, going after lawful firearms owners. And so I'll remind folks as well, that when they first brought forward these amendments, and that's a very sneaky way in November, and then they withdrew them on November 3rd, they said, well, we're going to do consultations. So we did a couple consultation meetings at committee, and uh, we brought forward a lot of people uh, to talk about the impact that those amendments would have. Liberals saying they're not going after hunting rifles. Well, we brought forward a lot of hunters, experts in that regard, and they have a very different opinion than the Liberals, the ones who actually use these to hunt have a very different opinion than the Liberals who want to ban them. Interesting, Madam Speaker. But the Minister of Public Safety also went on a nationwide tour to consult himself, and uh, he received quite the backlash in many of the meetings that he went to. I wonder how many Conservative writings. Exactly, I'd love to know that, actually. I would imagine it's not very many. But anyway, he went to Yukon, and in the uh, local paper there, the Yukon News, on January 25th, in response to his... Uh, tour to talk to the hunters who's looking to take their firearms away, he said, or it was said in the, in the media, quote, none of those who spoke with Mendicino and Han, oh, pardon me, I'm not allowed to say their names, I take that back, sorry, Madam Speaker, none of those who spoke to the Minister of Public Safety or the Liberal member for Yukon, pardon me, were supportive of the proposed legislation. They each gave their reasons. Among them were longtime firearm collectors concerned about a loss of value in their collections, relatively new sports shooters encountering confusing rules reoccurring theme we're hearing actually from the firearms community uh, and the police that have to enforce these rules and hunters trappers and resource industry workers worried that the firearms they rely on to protect themselves from animals in the wilderness will be banned and uh, in that same article it was quite uh, the quotes were quite um, I will say emotional would be the polite word of the local people that were so-called consulted by the Minister of Public Safety deeply unhappy with what the Liberals are trying to do and um, so there was a lot of that going on on his tour. He heard loud and clear, and yet he brought forward a very similar definition. And rather than being transparent with the very long list of hundreds of firearms they're looking to ban, they're going to pass it on to a firearms advisory committee. <laughs> so despite all these consultations at committee, all these consultations with the Minister of Public Safety and all the things he's heard firsthand from the, the real law-abiding people that all these things impact, um, they're trekking, they're, they're trudging forward, plowing through, Madam Speaker. Liberals are determined to gradually, in fact, actually quite quickly, eliminate a lot of hunting rifles from Canada. 
And so at committee, we actually had a lot of Indigenous uh, leaders come and speak to the impact all of this would have on them. And again, C21 has a number of uh, red flag uh, provisions and other things that I will say when they were originally brought forward, I, I thought, oh, red flags, like this is supposed to help uh, vulnerable women and Indigenous women and this could be good. I actually stood in the House and said, why don't we split red flags from the bill so we can maybe usher those along more quickly, take the politics out of it so we can protect vulnerable people. I stood in the House, Minister of Public Space Safety shouted down uh, that uh, uh, motion that I brought forward to do that. that. Again, another good faith effort from Conservatives to take some of the politics out of this contentious issue. Shouted down by the Minister of Public Safety, I will never forget that. Anyway, so Indigenous leaders, women chiefs and others came to committee and uh, they were very alarmed by some of these red flag laws, in fact. Uh, they said a number of things. They talked about how the red flag laws, in essence, will, they felt, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but they felt that there could be people who have negative views of Indigenous people could more easily call in and make up false stories about Indigenous people to take their firearms away. This is a real thing we heard from multiple Indigenous leaders that this will not be good for our community and those who don't like us, in essence, to paraphrase uh, their sentiments. That's what we came across. Oh, okay. That's not so good. This is supposed to protect Indigenous people, particularly women. It doesn't seem like they want this at all. In fact, they don't want it very badly. And then we also heard from law experts, women in the law experts. I think that was the name of the organization. It was a liberal witness. There was also a... Uh, Anti-Violence Against Women Quebec group. All three of these groups who were brought forward, I think the thought process from Liberals would be to support these red flag laws, said that they're terrible. They don't want them. They actually further burden women who are being abused by their partners. The exact opposite of what I thought the red flag laws were going to do. So obviously I'm not going to support them. We're not going to support them. And I don't believe uh, some of the other opposition parties uh, did either. So. Again, we can work together on a few things, that's evident. But again, this is a measure that was trying to be brought forward by Bill C-21 that wasn't listening to the people that they were trying to help, to the issue that they were trying to solve. Another very clear example that they were not listening to vulnerable women and Indigenous people about something that they said was going to help them. Just, a, just symptomatic of how the government approaches firearms, Madam Speaker. There were also, I'll talk about, uh, we actually, it was pretty interesting. We had one of the most notable Canadian hunters, a uh, really incredible guy from an incredible family. His daughter, as is Jim Shockey I'm talking about, his daughter is quite um, a hero for young women hunters across the country. I'll have to say, one of my sisters uh, follows her on Instagram, has for years. Anyway, sidebar. He said, everybody understands hunters are not a threat to public safety or the national security of this country. However, we feel, feel vilified and marginalized. Recently, we felt attacked. We're not the enemy. We love our country. The taking away of life is obviously a terrible and fundamentally wrong thing. And the taking away of a, life, a way of life is also wrong. Pretty powerful quote, I thought, coming from someone who is knows hunting really probably better than almost anyone in the country, aside from the indigenous Canadians who've been hunting on this land for thousands of years. So when they say, when Liberals say this isn't a hunting rifle ban, well, ask hunters, Madam Speaker. They saw the SKS on the list. They saw other firearms on the list that they commonly use for hunting. So who should the public believe? People who actually hunt and use these for a living and pass them down to their kids? Or Liberals who, as we've heard from the Prime Minister, says that some hunting guns are going to have to be banned? And in my opinion, that's just the beginning, obviously. Again, ask a Liberal, is this going to be the last hunting ban or rifle ban or shotgun ban or firearm ban? I'm going to guess they're going to say no. Madam Speaker, or they're going to change the subject real quick. Uh, and then who else do we have? Well, we had Martin Bourget. He was, um, him and his wife, very lovely actually, uh, they're a Quebec French, they have a Quebec French hunting show because hunting in Quebec is huge, massive, massive industry in Quebec. Um, and they said legitimate gun owners in Canada are deeply puzzled about the very legitimacy of the process set out in Bill C-21 and the enforcement of these measures. They are asking for nothing less than a study of the bill's true impact on the safety of Canadians and on traditional hunting, harvesting, and sports shooting. Of course, we never really got an in-depth study about all of those things. We had a couple of consultation meetings, and now they're really trying to limit debate of the impact of many of these amendments. So unfortunately, Mr. Bourget and his lovely wife and all the, I think she, her herself, the wife, represents 20,000 female French hunters. 
pretty amazing, actually, that that exists. I really hope I get a chance to go hunting with them someday. Anyway, they're speaking for their large group of hunters. Not a big fan of this. I feel that the consultations haven't been met and the true depth of respect that is needed for our hunting community, our farmers, Indigenous Canadians, not being met at committee and certainly not being met by the Liberals. Actually, I will tell you, there is something on consultation. The Liberals uh, did a few years ago, they did a consultation on firearms. They spent over $200,000. We got this from an information request. They spent over $200,000 on this request. Of the 133 respondents, about 87% of the respondents when asked about uh, should further measures be taken for ha against handguns, in essence was the question, 87% said no of the 133,000 respondents when asked the same question about so-called assault style firearms, again, liberals made up term, not, not a firearm term, but that's the term they use. Anyway, 133,000 respondents, $200,000 of this uh, consultation, and I think it was about s between 70 and 80 percent said no, no more action needed. I think that's pretty shocking. The actual consultation they spent significant taxpayer dollars on and 133,000 people responded. Very few of them think that any of these measures should be undertaken, so I assume they kind of just chucked that in the garbage because they really haven't talked about it at all. And the evidence is right there, and yet they uh, don't want to look at it or acknowledge that that's, uh, in fact, what Canadians believe. They talk about some random poll once, and that's it, but the, the 133,000 people that were asked, not a lot of support for what they're doing. Anyway, very inconvenient facts for the Liberals that we found out through an information request. So, who else did we ask? Oh, um, we talked to... Someone from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. This is a massive hunting and angling. One of the oldest associations, I think, in the country. Very notable, very reputable, very moderate. It's a hunting and angling association. I grew up going to my local game and fish association. These are some of the lifeblood of the hunting community. And certainly being from Ontario, I believe that this uh, hunt, uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters is the largest in the country. I think they represent about 100,000 members, active members, let alone uh, the other impacts that they've had, all the family members and small communities that they support. And they said, firearms are not the disease, particularly in a nation like Canada with robust gun laws. Gun violence is often symptomatic of a much bigger societal issue. Very, very poignant point. Yes, uh, I would agree with that. Taking firearms away from law-abiding Canadians will not reduce the upstream issues that fuel criminal activity and the demand for illicit firearms. Therefore, model-based firearm prohibitions will continue to fail as they won't be able to have a detectable impact on reducing gun violence or enhancing public safety. Again, this person is an illegal, or actually they might be, I don't know their real profession, but I don't believe they're a legal expert, and yet very eloquently put in a very obvious statement that they've taken that seems very foreign when you're looking at the liberal priorities on firearms and the relentless assault on law-abiding Canadians. Marc Renault, president of the Fédération Québécoise des Chasseurs et Pêcheurs. They said in French, but I'll say it in English, we strongly believe in the power of education and prevention for promoting firearm safety. Our members want to feel safe too, and they hope new laws intended to improve public safety focus on the right targets. Hunters and sports shooters who comply with the training requirements and get the right licenses are the wrong target. Again, this was in response to the November 2022 G4 and G46, the definition, the long list. They brought forward a very similar definition and the list will just be passed over, as was said today in the House by the Liberal Parliamentary Secretary, to the Firearms Advisory Committee. So again, we're here again. These are the comments from hunters, from hunters, from large hunting advocacy groups. And they're still saying this isn't a hunting rifle ban. Linda Keiko, Olympian, women's pistol shooting. So many people may not know, and again, if, you're, if you follow Olympics, you'll know this, and Olympians, we're very proud as Canadians about our Olympians. Well, we have Olympic sport shooters as well and have had for a very, very long time. I think over a century we've had Olympic sport shooters, obviously. I mean, if you look at hunting just like anything else, if you have hunters, if you have farmers who use them as tools, if you have uh, people in the military, if you have police, you're obviously going to have folks that use firearms and who's the best shot? Who's the most accurate target? That's obviously uh, something that comes from the firearm community, very obviously. Uh, it's actually a sense of real pride if you're a good marksman, someone who doesn't know nothing about hunting or sport shooting, wouldn't understand that, I get it. But if you are from a hunting community, 
Every person knows that when someone gets a big buck, you sit around the table and the hunter relives his ep or her epic story about the hunt. And they tell you, oh, it's 400 yards and it was windy. And they recount this great story of their great hunt. It's part of the culture. Indigenous Canadians the same for thousands of years. This is important. So if you're a good marksman or markswoman, it's uh, something that you'd almost brag about. This is very normal and natural in the hunting and sports shooting community. Of course, sports shooting uh, also comes in part from that. So it is incredible that Canada has some of the best marksmen in the world. And Linda Keiko and her family are some of the best marksmen in the country. In particular, she's in the women pistol shooting. And uh, the liberal efforts to freeze or ban or whatever they're saying of C20, in C21 on handguns, which really won't do any of that. All it does, really, we've heard from our Olympic sports shooters and our national sports shooters from IPSC and the like, which is a national sports shooting association that competes internationally. Uh, we've heard that what this will really do is impact our sports shooting community. It makes it very difficult for them to get new parts for the tools they use when they compete makes it very difficult for them to bring their firearms in and out of the country for competition, makes it very difficult for Canada to host any sort of sports shooting competition. It makes it very challenging. World Fire and Police Games are coming up in Winnipeg, actually is hosting the World Fire and Police Games. Pretty incredible. And it is a nightmare to try to get firearms in for the important parts of that, uh, of the sports shooting part of that competition. Again, real sense of pride for Winnipeg and Canada that we are hosting World Fire and Police Games. Very excited this summer. That's a sidebar. But Linda Keiko, our proud Olympian, who all Canadians should be very proud of, I am certainly, and I know the Conservatives are, she said, I take great pride in representing my country on the world stage, as do all athletes. I'm sad that due to the handgun ban, the order in council, Bill C-71, and this proposed legislation, C-21, I will not be able to represent Canada on the world stage. Athletes who come after me won't even have an opportunity to compete, as they will have no access to competition firearms. So the Liberals with C-21, out of the mouths of the sports shooters themselves, they are wiping out sports shooting in Canada. Certainly this will be the last generation that ever sports shoots, uh, certainly with pistols for sure. And when asked about that, when challenged about that at committee, the Liberals looked down their nose at our sports shooters and in essence, again people can go look back at the video footage, but in essence we're saying, well, Canada doesn't want that anymore. We're, we, we're, we don't want that. Those dirty Olympian sports shooters. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, this is my tone being put on the Liberals, so, but people can go look at the video. It is, in essence, just looking down their nose, judging sports shooters, saying, you're not welcome anymore in Canada, we don't want you, get out. That's the sense that I walked away with when I watched that interaction between Liberals and our Olympian. I couldn't believe it. Everyone should be proud of our Olympians, especially our Bex marksman and a woman. That's awesome, you know? Like, jeez. So we will fight very, very hard to ensure that we can continue to compete internationally with IPSC and Olympic sports shooting. But again, once this passes, and they did it already through regulation, we will see the death of sports shooting in Canada, particularly with pistols first, and then likely the rest if they get to proceed with their true agenda here. So it's just very frustrating in that regard, Madam Speaker, that we have real people who actually use these as tools coming forward to committee saying you're banning our hunting rifles, you're banning our ability to compete in sports shooting on the world stage and represent Canada with pride. And they're saying, no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. This isn't, that's not true. So who do you believe? The people who are impacted by that or the liberals who don't want people to own firearms, which is what I think is really going on here. So what about the data? We could talk a lot about the facts of this because we see in committee, the liberals bring forward folks of various stripes and we're all allowed to bring forward our own witnesses. That's part of the democratic process. But this is the party that consistently says we follow the science. We believe in data. We follow the science over and over and over again. Except when the science does not suit their agenda, right, Madam right. Speaker. It's very clear. Some of the best researchers in the world are from Canada when it comes to firearms. Dr. Kaylin Langman is uh, an award-winning researcher, highly recognized in the medical and scientific research community for his work. He has scrutinized every possible data point in Canada, uh, looking at how the impacts of subsequent gun control uh, have come in and what that has done or not done on homicide, whether it's mass homicide, homicide, domestic homicide, he's looked at it all. 
for decades looked at it. He's looked at Australia. He's also uh, commented on the UK as well. And not only has he done his own research, but he's reviewed the research of others because of his very high, uh, the ability that he has to heavily scrutinize data, and again, uh, widely recognized in the scientific community for his high level of integrity and scrutiny on this. I have not seen one piece of evidence even close to the integrity of Dr. Kalen Langman when it comes to the firearm uh, impact of gun control on homicide. There's nothing that holds a candle to it. They brought nothing forward. And I've heard actually in the court cases that are ongoing on this right now, they haven't brought forward any evidence the government really either to make their case for this, but that's another discussion I will likely get to at some point as well, Madam Speaker. So Dr. Kalen Langman, after all of his research, he said, the evidence so far demonstrates that the proposed handgun and semi-automatic rifle bans would have no associated reduction in homicide rates or mass homicide rates. Methods that have been shown to be more effective in reducing firearm homicides involve targeting the demand side of the firearm surveillance and criminal activity. So again, it seems very obvious. This is what police have been telling us, but he's actually seen that in the data. In fact, what he's found, and some other researchers of, of high repute have also found, is that the only real impacts you can have in terms of responsible gun ownership are basic things that we've had for almost 30 years. So we could talk about background checks, licensing, and safe storage. Those are the only proven things to have an impact on homicide and public safety when it comes to firearms. The only things, and those are things that are very much supported by the Conservative Party of Canada and that we've had for a number of years. That is responsible gun ownership, Madam Speaker, and we're behind that 100%. Only licensed, trained, and vetted by police people should ever have ownership over uh, firearms. That is what we believe. That is very clear. That's what the evidence says is important to protect public safety. And yet they're ignoring the scientific evidence by uh, highly reputable researchers and medical doctors, and they're cherry-picking the information that suits their narrative. That has been widely really shredded by Dr. Kalen Langman in his high degree of integrity and research ability. We also have Dr. Terry Bryan, Chief Firearms Officer of Alberta Chief Firearms Office. I have actually never met a person who's as much of a firearms expert as she is. It's incredible. I, you ask her about any firearm, and this woman knows. It's unbelievable. Great to see. And she said, even after the withdrawal of G4 and G46, Bill C-21 continues to undermine confidence in our firearms control system while contributing nothing to reducing the violent misuse of firearms. Bill C-21 is built on fundamentally flawed premise. Prohibiting specific types of firearms is not an effective way of improving public safety. It will waste billions of taxpayer dollars that could have been used on more effective approaches such as the enforcement of firearms prohibition orders, reinforcing the border, or combating the drug trade and gang activity. Again, it seems self-evident, but to hear from an expert who's charged with this uh, at the provincial level, it's refreshing. We had her expertise at committee. And again, all of this was said, and yet there really is no change in what was brought forward. And we asked a number of questions, just to say, again, actually, on the definition, Madam Speaker, the Liberals brought forward something else that I think I, I should have mentioned at the beginning, but it is unsettling because we're not really clear of what the implications will really be. It seems good, kind of, but then maybe it's really not. And again, based on their track record of lack of transparency on this, I'm deeply concerned. So there's, a, in essence, sort of a forward-looking clause that they've brought forward for that definition. It's kind of a grandfathering clause in a, in a way. Anyone who owns these firearms that they're looking to ban now apparently gets to keep them. Who would have thought? We get to keep them, they're saying, for now. Of course, we'll see what the Firearms Advisory Committee says in a couple months, Madam Speaker. But they're saying anything that falls under this new definition that they've brought forward, which is really the old definition, anything that falls under the new one, you actually get to keep those and you get to keep buying and selling them. It's just brand new models that are manufactured. Can't buy those. So any new versions of these firearms you don't get to buy. So, okay, that sounds okay, I guess. It just kind of limits almost exact same firearms that'll come out that are new. We can't buy those, but we can buy these. That doesn't really follow. It further doesn't follow. They've been getting up in the House and at press conferences for months now, actually for years, and saying insane things like these are weapons of war designed for killing people. They've been taking that position They've been very clear, these are terrible things that no one should own, and yet now they've brought forward a new definition that allows everybody to keep them? That doesn't make sense. So we spent about an hour and a half asking clarifying questions about this, and I'm not reassured that what we're seeing is really the case, and if it is, 
What I can tell you is I feel quite confident that they're going to just shoot this over. They're going to say, oh yeah, you can keep them, but we're going to send it over to the advisory committee and they'll ban it for us. That's what I think is really going to happen here. Madam Speaker, people will let their guard down, the firearms community will let their guard down with this new definition lets people keep firearms, but they're not going to get to keep them, Madam Speaker, because I believe under the Firearms Advisory Committee, which they've in essence alluded to when asked about the SKS, they're going to be the ones to do the dirty work, so to speak. They're going to be the ones, as was said today, to look at that very long list they were looking to ban that was hundreds of pages long and had hundreds of hunting rifles in it. They're going to be looking at that list and looking to ban those firearms. We heard as much today. So people should not be reassured for one moment by this new definition. It's kind of leading people down the garden path, so to speak, letting people let their guard down. But we know what's going on here, Madam Speaker, and Conservatives, along with law-abiding citizens in this country, private property owners who are trained, tested, and vetted by police, will continue to stand up for those people who have been repeatedly kicked by this Liberal government and treated terribly like they're criminals, since that seems to be the focus, Madam Speaker. And just to conclude with my remaining two minutes, I believe, Madam Speaker, about two minutes, I, have to, I do have to say this just to conclude for now. I know I'm going to take a pause and I'll restart at some point, but just to conclude for this uh, hour and ten minutes that I've been speaking, the minister seems to have really, really cranked down on his remarks that conservatives who we're standing with, he's been vicious in talking about who we're standing with, who, and I'm being the lead, so he's talking about me and the leader of the opposition, who I'm standing with when I'm talking about law-abiding citizens and fighting for firearms owners. He makes outlandish, unfounded claims about who I'm standing with when I'm in this House talking about this. I find it deeply offensive, and here's why, just to conclude, Madam Speaker. Do you want to know who I'm standing with? Madam Speaker, I went to a Game and Fish Association in rural Manitoba just the other day, and I spoke to them about, it's actually from my hometown, Beauxjolais, Manitoba, and I spoke to them about the work that I'm doing here in the House to fight for their way of life. And a big, burly, you know, country boy came up to me at the end, Mr. Speaker. He came up to me at the end, and I was, I was leaving, and he was rushing to get to me. And he kind of, he's like, please let me talk to you for a moment. And this big guy... And he's like, I just want to thank you for fighting for firearms owners, Mr. Speaker. He said to me, he looked me in the eye, and I could see that he was visibly getting emotional. He's like, thank you for fighting for us. Thank you for standing up for us. Thank you for always fighting against the liberals and standing up for our way of life, Mr. Speaker. And he had to start walking away because he was getting emotional. This big country boy, I couldn't believe it. And I have actually been getting that a lot. So that's who I'm fighting for, Mr. Speaker. Those good Canadians, and I will fight for them every single day without stop relentlessly. Mr. Speaker. So thank you very much, and we'll pick this up again next time. Thank you. Well done. Well done.